Hi there, this is uh, intended to be um, a video of an example of play of the game Plan Orange. It's uh, not an example of play that you might find in um, a rule book, uh, as in how an instructional on how to play, but more an example of someone playing the game, i.e. me, and uh, it's just to give you an idea of, of how uh, the game plays. Um, it won't necessarily be optimal strategy, like more likely than not. It's my fourth game solo play, and um, only uh, and uh, I, I'm by no means a. I'm still kind of pretty much got the rules, learnt the rules, and you know used all the rules. Um, but. Uh, I've just jogged my thing. I've just put encounters back, um, but I'm going to. I'm not going to spend too long thinking about strategy for the sake of the video, so that there's not big pauses. Okay, so the game starts like this. You have um, uh, force chips like this is a counter saying force one, and that represents all the forces that are in the um, off map box, so called here. So we've got um, a cruiser group. Uh, the US fleet train, which is essentially sort of supplies and logistical train, um, two air units, a marine regiment, and a um, infantry division on Oahu in uh, 1932, January 1932. Um, you also have the um, American headquarters, and it has a range of 30, which is the range in which it can activate units for offences. That range stretches all the way out to here. I've marked it on my map with these these markers. So essentially it allows them to operate as far as the Philippines and in the Philippines, um, but not anywhere further. And uh, by the way, rather superfluously, all these um, places here are not playable. Um, the map was just culled directly from the Rising Sun map and uh, they, they didn't bother to sort of take out any play. And also with the play aids, there's redundant and irrelevant information on the play aids, which I, I f find a bit um, silly, but I guess they added it in because I think this game is, it was sort of considered a, a training game in a, in a way for, um, not the Rising Sun, but Empire of the Sun game. So I understand why they might have left it in, but I think it was lazy. To, they could at least grade out these, because otherwise there's quite a lot going on here. It's a bit confusing. Essentially, all you need to concentrate on are the Philippines, um, Japan, and then um, uh, Seoul and uh, Jabin, Harbin here in uh, China, because... Um, Whoever has the Philippines at the end will win, or the US can win an automatic victory by either taking all the hexes in mainland Honshu, the biggest island of Japan, or um, blockading it, which means that it, it can, does not have a line of supply to Harbin or Seoul there in, in Korea. So um, you, you do have Dutch Harbour up here, you have Funafuti here. There's a, uh, um, they, they both have harbours, and these are crucial. There's a harbour here in Honolulu. The next nearest harbour is here, and these are crucial because you need to base um, fleets in a harbour, and the, 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 then your offensive will say how far you can move, and an offensive will essentially be 10 or 15 hexes from that harbour. So, for example, from here, you could probably reach out to here, so you cannot reach Japan or the Philippines. Um, from here, you can reach Japan, from here, also from Truk and um, Saipan there. So, um, the US essentially, it, could, it can sort of send a route through here, it could send a route up here, I'm not sure the facility of that. Maybe from there you can reach Hokkaido and then from there the mainland and these. But another sort of concrete uh, or definite potential is to get move from Funafuti up to the Marshalls here and then from the Marshalls maybe straight to Japan or, and or the Philippines or from here to here and then to either of those from there. Um, so you could ignore all this and in between you've got lots of um, uh, air, uh, atolls or single hex islands which have air 
fails on them. So planes can go there, but obviously the uh, fleets cannot base. Now, the US fleet train can be used um, to add a, a harbour to any of these um, islands with an airfield, so for example the Marcus or Iwo Jima, for example, or Midway indeed. There's a, you can have, there's an airbase there, but uh, no fleet yet, but you, you, uh, no port. US can put one there, but it takes a while. You have to have the fleet train there, and then it will happen the next turn, unless you get a certain card. Now there is one US offensives card which gives them 30 movement instead of the normal 15, so you could go all the way from Oahu to the Philippines with that. That's only one offensive card, and these decks are 24 cards. Um, the, the game starts with the Japanese playing two offensives, uh, then the US get two cards, the Japanese get one, the US plays one card, the Japanese plays their one, and the US plays their last one, and then that is the end of game turn one, January to April. Then we move into May to August for um, five more game turns, and each will get five cards, and with the US going first, them alternating card play. Uh, you might run all the way through your deck, um, quite easily because you can play reaction cards out of your turn and they are replaced with another card. So for example the Japanese potentially could get three um, reaction cards, the US might play one or two offences and the Japanese would be playing those during the US offensives in the US turn having those cards replaced. So you see you can run through your deck even though um, you're only taking five a turn. Um, so I think, uh, so what what we have essentially, we have Force A of the Japanese, that's um, sort of a cruiser, battle cruiser, destroyer group here. We have Force B here, which has um, a light carrier, the Hosho, uh, and battleships and so forth here. Then we have their two um, main carriers, the Akagi and the Kaga here. Uh, then the US are in control of the Philippines, they just have one light cruiser group. Uh, some infantry and an air group there. Then the Japanese have these scattered islands and they are facing off Guam and Saipan here with the US infantry and air. The Japanese likewise opposite them. Then most of the US forces are, um, there's Force 5 which is base, which uh, 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 are their two CVs and their ma main battleship group which is based on the west coast of the US on the strategic display. They have some on the east coast in the Caribbean Sea, they have to move through the Panama Canal. The Japanese can get a reaction card which can close that canal, so then they have to come round um, South America, it will take longer. The US also has these units here, uh, a s smattering of all types of units, air, infantry and um, fleets, which will be mobilised from turn three onwards. Um, the US starts with three amphibious shipping points, the Japanese start with two, those are regenerated every turn. That essentially dictates how many amphibious or, or how, uh, how much you can transport in an amphibious invasions per turn. So without further ado, let's get on. Uh, so the Japanese, they, they have the Philippines offensive or the Guam offensive. They can play both of these, they just have to decide. Um, and there will be no interference from the Americans because they don't have any cards. They just have to decide which one to do first. The Philippines has a logistics value of 8, so they could activate 8 units plus the headquarters value, which is 1 for both of them in this game. So essentially 9 units, and the Guam offensive is 6. You don't have to attack Guam or the Philippines with these. You can do what you like. Um, but it's suggested to take Philippines because that's how the Japanese can win. Another way that either side can win is by at any point having significant superiority um, in ratio of, of fleet units against the other. Um, but you're going to have to have some pretty hefty and devastating naval battles for that to occur. So uh, the Japanese are going to start with the Philippines offensive. So. Uh, they can activate eight units within range of their headquarters. And by the way, their headquarters stretch, range stretches as far as here, dictated by these. So you can see, um, although they could get to this island here, there's no um, ports. They don't have a fleet train. They can't build ports. So the furthest port they could get to 
is Kwajalein here. They cannot reach Funafuti. Um, any unit that is there is out of uh, supply range and will, will become attrited um, at the beginning of a turn, no, at the end of a turn. Um, I believe that's correct with fleets as well as um, infantry uh, ground units. Um, so it's not likely that uh, put to, to affect a Pearl Harbor and also down here. Essentially, and the US have one more offensive card than the Japanese. The Japanese have one more reaction card, but that one of their reaction cards is a counter offensive, so they could launch an offensive during the American term at turn as a counter offensive. But the US offensive cards have a greater logistics value by far in, in total and, and generally than the Japanese, um, so they can move a lot more material uh, um, in an offensive. So you can see that the Japanese, they need these initial offensives to get what they can and then they're going to try and hold on, pretty much like what happened in the Second World War. So uh, we're going for the Philippines. Um, now the order that you do things is, is very important because there's air here and that will preclude amphibious invasions unless we have an air zone of influence on it. So it has a zone of influence one hex all around and... Um, because this is a 3 uh, OC card, that means we've got 15 hexes we can move. Now we've got CVs here, and we have the CVL here. Um, I think what I'll do is move the CVL down to here. So that's from Force B, which is here. So that'll be moving 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then up. I will move that into that hex. Hang on, my son's calling me. Okay, so that little interruption gave me a bit more time to think about the plan of attack. So um, what we're going to do is the CVL goes into here and with its zone of influence it neutralises that, which then means we can bring in infantry from here. And we've got 16 there, and we're going to bring 8 more, which gives us 24. What that means is that even if we're, uh, if we're on the 1, the defence strength they have there is 12. So we're hopefully going to do, even if we're halved, we're still going to do a flip to them. Um, so that's 1, 2, 3 units. Then we're going to bring in 3 naval units, giving us 24 attack strength, so that... Um, the, the Marblehead Navy there has um, eight, uh, sorry, six defence. So even if we're quartered again, we're going to flip it. Hopefully, we'll um, destroy it completely to the two steps, which will be twelve defence, because it would get six on one, six on the other to soak up the attack. So that gives us one, two, three, four, five, six out of nine. Then um, this unit's coming all the way around here. It can just make it 15 hexes into Davao. To take the Philippines, we need to take Manila, Leyte, and Davao. And then finally, the ED infantry from here can move into Leyte there. So uh, that's nine. Um, units activated. Um, so we have battle axes here, here and here. Now it's a surprise attack. They have no reaction so um, they cannot activate any units. So that air can actually not be activated into the battle. But um, actually let, let me check that. Yes, that's right. So because I'm um, surprised, he cannot activate. And there is an option. Normally you could roll an intelligence roll, even if you didn't have a reaction to alter the surprise attack. But there's no intelligence rating on the, this uh, card if used as an offensive. So that air cannot activate. It's just um, his only ability really was to require air naval units in there to cancel its zone of influence. So we go straight. We'll start with this battle hex will go straight to the air naval battle. Um, so the US has a total of 24 plus 2 now for the CVL that's 26 um, and sorry that, that the Japanese has 26 and the US has 6. 
um, we roll the die and the US get two. Now that is modified by nothing, so their um, combat rating is quartered. Um, we're rolling a d10 here and that was a low roll. So th let's round it up. So effectively they're going to do two, have two combat effectiveness. And the Japanese roll six, they get plus three for a surprise attack. That is a nine. So they're times by one, so they get their full strength. So the marble flips, so, so that means that they do 26 points of damage. The marble head has six on that side, another six on that half side, so it can take 12 points of damage. The rest is... Oh, I think you can bring it on to the infantry units. Um, No, yeah, the remaining hits are lost. Uh, if we were the only uh, neighbour, we could do some hits, but we could um, flip potentially the infantry ones there. So the marble head has gone, and um, doing only two points of damage, the defence strength of the US is up to eights and nines, so that it does no damage in return. So now we go to the infantry, the, the amphibious assault. Now that amphibious assault, because we moved in two core stroke army units, that takes two a a ASPs. Now we get three temporary with this, so I spent four. I have two to start with, so I got one left. So in fact I can't do all of those. Damn. I can't do either of those. I don't have enough. Uh, Okay, so I better put those back. I could send in a division and that would be it because I've over secured myself on Manila. Oh well, that was potentially foolish because now the US will get an opportunity to reinforce here. So I could anyway send that division in with my last ASP. Well, I could use um, the Guam offensive to, to re attack the Philippines. Um, yeah, I'll do that anyway. Okay, so back to here. So we're on... S the Japanese have 16 plus 8 is um, 24 again. Against the US have 12. And the US rolls a 9, which is a nice roll. They get plus 3 because it's an amphibious attack. So they get a benefit on that. So they can double their power. So they've got... What did I say? 8. So they're on 16. Now, oh, sorry, because this is a surprise attack, it's not simultaneous, so the Japanese go first. Their roll was five. Now, because they're the only one with naval units left, they get plus two. And also, because there's, they are the only active air, um, then they get another plus two. Uh, but they get a minus two because it's mixed terrain, so they just get net plus two. So that's a seven. One and a half, so they can... 24 plus 12, 36. They did 36 damage, so this Philippine division's got 10, and that one takes up 2, and that one's gone. That's the railroad gun. And then another 10 from the Philippines, he's gone, so they don't actually get to go back. So I think that was a bit of overkill there on my part, but I was... Uh, okay, I forgot. On the naval, you can go... You, your strength can be quartered you roll a 0 to 2. On the ground it can only be halved on a 0 to 2. I've forgotten that, so that was a bit of overkill. Never mind, they've taken Manila, Manila and now down here there's no air naval, so we just go straight to the amphibious invasion. Uh, this is a bit risky for the Japanese. They rolled, Japanese rolled a 9, is a surprise attack, so they can double. So that, that gives them 12, and we have 4 and then four, so yeah, that was actually fine for them. There, so they've taken two thirds of what they need in the Philippines, and that is uh, now there's post battle movement. Um, the US have none activated, so they can't, but the Japanese they could because they've got the port here, they can post battle move their navy into that port, and I think I will do that. Uh, the infantry. The uh, ground forces don't post battle move. Uh, one thing I forgot to do was I was going to activate the air there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-
seven, eight. Yeah, so that air could have been activated, but then it would have fought that on its own, so... I don't think... So that I, I actually only used... Seven logistics points, and I had nine, so I could have moved two more. And you don't have to... Um, For those last two, I'm going to move out these CVs. Um, you don't have to do an offensive movement. They're going to strategic move out to Kwajalein there. Um, essentially, they could have gone 30 with a strategic move from friendly port to friendly port with that, so that's well within their range. Okay, so that was that first offensive, the Philippines offensive. Um, now we go to their second offensive, the Guam offensive. Uh, logistics value of six, so plus one for the headquarters, that's seven units they can activate. So they can activate these again. Um, uh, we just need Davao, this is going to be easy to do. Um, that could be half to so 16, so I'll take. Now we've got two temporary ASPs, got none left. It's regular, so I use what those two to send the Southern Expeditionary Corps out again. So that's for the amphibious invasion. That's so that's one. Uh, I really wish I'd got some air in there. Um, one. Okay, and we have force B, we have an air unit here. We're going to activate that and send that by strategic transport. So that goes off map and it comes in the next turn as a reinforcement. So that's one, two. Um, now we've got a destroyer up here. We're going to bring this unit down here. Three, so he's going to add being the only naval unit there. In fact, he could um, do some bombardment beforehand. Yeah, okay. Um, so one, two, three, four, he's going off. No, okay. What I'm going to do is I'll move him there. So he's hopping. So activate that one and activate that one. So that's one, two, three, four, five. Um, Six, no, we don't have any more for amphibious, do we? Four, five. And the Marshall Islands are, t are held by the Japanese, so this can hop three times, one, two, three, and go onto there. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. I've got one more. And what we'll bring for that is a carrier group from the Philippines to there to Guam itself. So um I'll do that so we've got a battle here. Um only the Japanese have the air naval. Again, it's a surprise attack. And I rolled a one, so that is in fact... But it's surprise pl attack plus three, so that goes up. So their effectiveness is halved. So that gives them four, but that's enough to flip that. And now we'll do the land combat. The Japanese roll four. They're the only one with 
navel in set six. So that's times by one. They're on 16. He's four. So he's gone. So they've got that nice and secure. And post battle movement, I will. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 15. Send that destroyer over to Iron Roy Talk for that destroyer group. And so now here we've got two air and the Takao cruiser group versus the 20 PG air group. Surprise attack. So they have 8 plus 4 and 4 makes 16. They roll 5 plus 3 for surprise attack, that goes on times 1, so 16, and that has 4 and 4, so that's gone. Now the US will be able to replace some of these. The Japanese never get to replace their infantry, but they can replace air and fleets. The US can replace even their ground units. Um, okay, and so now... Uh, and, and That's it, because there's no infantry, so the infantry... There is fine and post battle movement. Um, this one will also likewise move out uh, to the CVs there. Maybe it was a bit risky putting them there within striking distance, but we shall see. Okay, so that was the, the initial offensive that starts off the war with the, the Japanese taking the Philippines and, then, and in this case threatening Guam in the Marianas. The US reply, as such, what is their preparedness? They have a reaction card, that's not so great. And they have Guam invasions. <laughs> if that would be really interesting, if the Japanese had taken Guam, the US invade it straight back. So this has a logistics value of nine. It's, it is default surprise, but it has EC intelligence condition of five. So the Japanese get sort of 60% chance to change that into intercept. It gives them bonuses on ground combat, the US on ground combat in Manila, Guam, Wake and Midway. So I think they would play that first. The Japanese also get a card. Uh, if it was been a reaction card that's what they would have hoped for because then they could react to any US offensive. It's not, it's a resource card so we we'll put that on the side for now. So the, Jap the US come into action as I said, they don't have so much available, they need to move their forces out. And they just have one s small cruiser group, uh, a cruiser group in based around the Portland in uh, Oahu. They can activate nine, and they have force five here. That can move to Oahu. But it's after that, it doesn't have enough range to move anywhere else. Alternatively, it could move strategically one, two, three to Samoa. And then the next activation, it can move out to Funafuti and start moving up there. The advantage of that is Funafuti is closer. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine hexes to there. So um, that means if you have an offensive car, which is, is 2AOC, if it's one that you could move five hexes in the, at the naval with two ten and then with three fifteen, so from Funafuti you can get there with a two offensive card, one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen. So you need a three from um, Honol from uh, the Hawaiian Islands. Um, so they could do it with that, but they don't have the force. But if force five goes there, they do. Um, Another option is to move fellows out from the east before potentially the Japanese close the Panama Canal. Something you have to bear in mind. Do you go for a quick strike or a slow, more considered build up? Um, in this case, I think. Uh, well, the US can't swipe strike quite a late. Quagellian just with the, the Portland. If it was a Portland on its own, maybe they could have taken it. If there was no Japanese naval there, they could have Portland and an infantry um, ground unit could have taken that probably with this offensive. But no, so the Japanese nicely st stymied that. Um, so the US going to play this and then 
9 logistics value plus 1 for that so they can move 10 units and force 5 they've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 so they're going to move that and because it's 3 they can move 3 on the strategic map which brings them to Samoa and the good thing as well because now the Japanese are here they're threatening midway because another useful thing for US is to put the fleet train out there um, in fact, that, that would have made a, an issue for playing this as the, the last card. What? Mm, yes, we could maybe use that as an offensive, use the OC value rather than the event and do that. So, okay, I'm thinking ahead. So, what was that? We had eight, moved down to here. Um, eight was one, two, three, we'll send division down with them, nine. And and a marine unit ten. Okay, so that's that offensive. No reaction. Um, so nothing happens. It's it's not a fighting offensive. It's just offensive move. Let's say. Okay, so uh, now the Japanese get to play this. They could play it as an offensive to activate, that would essentially activate two units, one for the headquarters, one for the OC value. Or they get this, as a resource it gives them two air replacements. Now my last game, they ended the game um, with like four or five air replacement stats they never spent. That was just the way it went. Uh, but generally air replacements are quite handy because what it essentially means is you can burn up your air units knowing that they're going to come back, how you commit them without too much fear in a sense. On the other hand, that one OC would allow, they could perhaps um, no, they haven't got any ASPs. So there's no more amphibious invasions they can do this turn. So they could only really do sort of some sort of strategic movement. So they're gonna take those, so air replacements handy resource to have, which leaves the US with that. They can't play it as a reaction to anything, so they're going to have to play it as the OC. And what they can do then, because we know that's safe, the Japanese don't get another go, and the US will go first the next turn, although their forces are down here, but still. Uh, um, what that's so that they're moving, they're using that one OC to move the fleet train out to there. And okay, better leave the Portland there. And mind you, one, two, three, four, five, they can't get there because the naval unit of naval movement of five with one OC. So they could go there and get a port out there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes, yeah, so they can't get to there too. Oh, is it worth putting the fleet train there? I think it might be just because it brings Wake into a bit closer range. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, and the marker silence. So they could perhaps get the next fleet train out there. So without having to take these, they could then threaten there. So we'll do that. I haven't done that before. Um, so that's one OC. They just move the fleet train and... Um, hmm. and I think that means they can abandon Midway and then come... No, there's no port yet, so I can't... Strategic move the port to port. Um, I don't have a DD, otherwise, I could use organic move. Okay. No, so that's. They'll have to move stuff in it later. So I think with the last, 
what we'll do is we'll move Uh, this division one, so it's a bit closer from the East US to the Caribbean, and that is that. Uh, okay, so that is the first turn over. So now we go to the beginning of the second game turn, US first, and we start with reinforcements. There are none because the US have not mobilized. And I think um, we will at this point reset the Japanese amphibious shipping points. Um, and the Japanese get a reinforcement of their air unit. So they can essentially place that within range and supply of the headquarters. So I'm going to put that, I think. Here, one, two, three, because then they cover each other. Those there have a range of three. So those two islands can cover each other. Uh, they can't quite reach Wake, unfortunately. Okay, um, and then we have replacements now. The US get two air replacements. They don't have any air to replace. Oh, yes, they do, for the one from the Philippines. So they can spend that immediately to bring on this air replacement point. And that will come on in the West US. But no, air can come straight on, isn't it? Yes. Just like the Japanese one, I should imagine. Um, sorry about this. Yeah, so it's a fly on activation, of course. Um, so we're going to protect the air ferry island there with that. Um, and um, so that's one air replacement. So the US have one left out of their two. They don't get to save any, so the last one's lost. They get one naval replacement. They can save up to two. They don't, don't have anything they can... Replace hell. The marble head was out, so yes, they can spend that and bring half a point back with the marble head. I don't think that's worth it. They're going to save that, um, and then their ground unit replacement is one. So with that, they're going to regenerate a step of the Philippine division that will go there in the West U.S. And, okay, so that's the US. Now the Japanese get um, one air replacement and they can save an infinite amount of those. They have none to replace at the moment, so they will save that. They get one naval replacement. Oh, I put the Japanese said the US. They get one naval replacement. They've got nothing to replace. They can save one and they get no ground. So that is the replacement reinforcements. And then we also get to place a fleet train... So we place it here, and uh, it is being built. It's not a port yet. Um, If it doesn't move in the offensive phase, I get to flip that at the end of the offensive phase. Okay, um, so it has to stay there the whole turn. So now um, we go to the cards. The US will get five, one, two, three, four, four offensives and a reaction. Wow. And the Japanese likewise. A reaction card, a resource, a reaction card. That is their counter-offensive, Kentai Kesson, for the first, second fleet to decisive battle. And they don't have any offensive card there, but three reactions and two resources. Um, okay, so the US kick off. War plan 1934 gives them a logistic value of nine. And 
and bonus in Atoll Bomb Ground Combat. That's Long Range Guns of Logistic Value of 6, Naval War College Wargaming Logistics Value of 9, and just a basic fleet offensive F naval units get plus 2 attack strength, only logistics value of 6. So um, we haven't got any railway guns left. Uh, and one thing I, a little unclear was I, I've, I'm not sure if once the Philippines is taken, if these units, if they're on the board, they're removed, but can they be regenerated when a replacement? Oh yeah, I forgot the attrition. There's a unit here that would be flipped in attrition because he was out of supply because his zone is in the zone of influence of the um, CVL there. Um, this unit's okay because the air unit there counteracts that zone of influence. Whoops. That's what happens when you stack things up on a box. Okay, so I think that all things considered, that's probably a good point to stop um, this example of play now. Um, I think it's given you a good enough idea how the game plays. Um, you'll get a much better idea, obviously. If we, we continue to sort of more details of how strategy works out, but essentially, we, the US now because this is three OC, that's two, so naval units could move 10 on that, 15 on that. They've got two of these. Essentially, what they're going to have to do to start with is reinforce this so that the Japanese do not attack there. Because the US are going to play one card now, then the Japanese, then the US. And the US don't know the Japanese have no offences. They could use one of these as an offensive. And for example, that they could use for three plus one for the headquarters. They could activate four units, go out to there. And also the Japanese, because they have this counter-offensive card, as soon as the US play one of these offences, they can slap that down. That gives them their own um, offensive of uh, eight. Only naval units, but... They're looking for a decisive battle. Um, not great for the Japanese if the US have only moved a few naval units, but I think essentially what they their first play would be is this one or this one for the th three there, which I uh, know because their fleet's here, so that would be five out to here, and then they're only ten. And that's 14 hits from there. So actually, I've completely scuppered the US. And, uh, one, two, three. Um, they're in big trouble. The, 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 that, that was a bad move, that because that fleet train's now wide open for Japanese attack. Um, so I shouldn't have done that at the end of last turn. That, that was a false move. Um, what I'd have to do is wait to bring in a f force five here. That's all these fellows bring that to here, and then I could use some to reinforce up to there and or offensive into there. If they're offensive, offensive in, into there, that might keep the Japanese off from attacking there. But they do have force B here. We've got naval here as well. So I have naval there, force A, force B, and then these um, scattered individual naval units there. So not very good uh, US start from me, but it gave you some idea of possibilities. So um, it's exciting. Uh, I, I think I'll carry on this game myself, uh, perhaps taking back that move. Um, uh, and uh, see where we go from here. You can see it very interesting um, what opportunities can come out. Um, I think what I might do is, is um, finish this game and then offer a video of my thoughts and um, considerations about this game as a whole.